Just here in Alaska, the Department of Fish and Game grants an average of 700 permits to hunt Kodiak bears in an effort to control the population. He's big. He's over nine foot. The fee is $500, but Joe Coolis of Bedford, Ohio, has spent an additional 5000 in expenses to take his shot. Take him now, Joe. He's down. He's hit hard. He's on his back in a hole. Coolis isn't here to bring food back for the family table. He's only after the skin and pelt. With at least two additional bears circling the kill, Coolis must quickly skin and flesh the Kodiak's hide. The massive bundle of fur now begins a remarkable journey that will take it first to the tanner, where the skin is salted, pickled, and turned into a soft, nearly permanent leather. Then it's shipped to Coolis' own taxidermy shop and studio. Here, it's fitted over a foam form and glass eyes. The finished mount is an uncanny match for the bear coolest bag in the frozen north. And now you have a life-size photograph, so to speak. You can look at it and say, oh, I remember when that happened and this happened. And then a lot of times it's definitely dangerous. So I think it's the accomplishment of what you have to go through and then achieving something, then reproducing it so it looks exactly like it did when it lied. You put all those things together and now you have something. You think, wow, that was really great. Very few people are neutral when confronted with a once-living head hanging from a wall, or a giant predator frozen at the moment of attack. Many find the ancient practice of mounting animals for display disturbing and downright macabre. Enthusiasts of taxidermy, however, feel a thrill and are in awe of what could be described as still lives of nature, perfectly preserved. When you get into taxidermy, it encompasses so many other kinds of work. Anatomy, biology, chemistry, woodworking, natural design. So when you put it all together under the word taxidermy, you, you can't help but not encompass the word art with it. The practice of taxidermy is undeniably popular. Experts estimate the number of practicing taxidermists to be as high as 35,000 in the United States alone. I tell them what I do and they take a step back away from me and some people scream and run away and mostly women are very upset by the fact but I see it, it is a very creative profession and I have a great deal of respect and love for the animals that I work on. We aren't barbarians, you know, our industry, our artistry is not antiquated. There was a, you know, recent kids film that 102 Dalmatians where you know, the, the, there was a taxidermist that was used. He was the evil villain. And that's certainly not what we are at all. We like to think of ourselves as professionals and, and artists, and we're doing a public service. The origins of taxidermy are tied to some of our first basic needs, clothing and shelter. I have to go back to Genesis. When Adam and Eve were, were banned from the Garden of Eden, the Lord God himself took the very first animal skin and fashioned clothing for Adam and Eve to wear. The need for animal skins for clothing and shelter soon led directly to the first crude forms of taxidermy. Primitive man did taxidermy by learning that he needed to come up with a decoy. An animal hide draped over a rock, bush, or even the hunter himself allowed us to get in close with spears and knives. Remember, there they wasn't the loud noise of gunshot. Everything was all close encounter. So they had to be very, very close to make these little flint tools do their work. For taxidermy to evolve beyond the ability to fool animals, a permanency would need to be added to the furs and hides. This process of chemically transforming skin into leather would come to be known as tanning. I think one of the most amazing testaments that we have in our time is the Iceman found in the Swiss Alps, 5,000 year old corpse who had leather shoes, leather bow quiver. Preserved hides now gave us a better chance against sometimes overwhelming elements. Well, we can go back as far as the Egyptians. They had a process of tanning animal skin into leather. Not only were the Egyptians adept at tanning, they developed some of the first practices of body preservation. And their work was not confined to humans. Mummified cats, dogs, apes, and oxen have been found in royal tombs alongside preserved kings and slaves. Pets were primarily mummified to serve members of the royal clan in the afterlife. Body preservation was discovered quite by accident 
when it was noticed that animals and humans who died in arid conditions didn't quickly decompose. Ridding a body or hide of fluids was the first step toward preserving a skin through time. Later, across the Mediterranean, Greeks and Romans were using preservation techniques to make different styles of sandals, boots, and shoes. They used barks, fruit peels, and leaves as tannin sources. These agents render the leather immune to decay and shrinkage. A tour around a modern tannery reveals that the techniques for processing skin into leather have been refined, but have remained essentially unchanged. A Greek, Roman, or Egyptian tanner would quickly become very comfortable with the equipment and tanning agents found here. Before these hides can be mounted by a taxidermist, they must be processed into leather. This is the stock room where we store all the skins that are delivered to the tannery. Most of the stuff here is deer and elk. Right here is a Cape Buffalo half mount. This is the head part, the feet, and the back of the hide. And over here, we have a, a giraffe leg. It came in pieces. We have four legs. We had the, the cape, and we had uh, the hide over here. Before hides are tanned, Excess layers of skin are cut away in a process called thinning. On large games such as elephant, rhino, or hippo, skin can be several inches thick. It must be brought down to less than a quarter inch so that the tanning solutions can be evenly absorbed. This hippo hide is being cut down with an ancient looking skiving knife. For large animals, this process can take weeks. The shavers have to break the resistance of the skin, but they can't make it too thin or too thick. If too thick, they won't get no stretch out of it. Two then the hair will fall out. After being shaved, skins are tossed into large vats filled with alum and salt. Alum draws out the living enzymes in the skin, turning it into leather. The skin's going that wet drum with the pickling agent. Once they come out of there, they're actually leather. From tanning to taxidermy, preserved furs could now be pulled over forms of wood and straw to create semi-permanent figures for display. These early underframes were often made by upholsterers and furniture builders. In these very early frames, the actual skulls of the animals being mounted were used. The skull of the animal was boiled and cleaned and scraped full of flesh and tissue. A wooden armature was set. A baseboard was shaped to accommodate the skull, add some support to the building materials, which would be excelsior, cotton, straw, wrapped with twine to fill all the voids. That was known as the old English style of taxidermy. Early bird undermounts were even simpler. Here's just a couple examples of, of a typical structure that's inside of bird mounts. In most older museums, we have these traditional mannequins that are put together with wire. Some of the original parts are stay inside, like the, the legs, for example. This is, these are the real legs. Wires run through them. Small, delicate body parts like bird legs and feet can't be tanned. They can, however, be drilled hollow, flushed, and coated inside and out with a preservative. Beginning in the early 1800s, the best way to deter anything from beetles to moths to rats was deadly arsenic. Arsenic was the most major advancement the industry of taxidermy, I think, ever had. Because now we had a way to stop infestation of vermin in our finished work. Credited to a 19th century French taxidermist, Louis Dufresne, the preservative had a distinct drawback. It was as poisonous to the taxidermist as it was to the pests he was trying to keep away from his work. Some of us got poisoned by arsenic, some of us died by arsenic, okay? And some of us just couldn't live without it. I still use arsenic myself. There are certain things I, when I, when I do a, a particularly rare piece or, or something where I know my, my integrity is on the line and I know I won't be subject to people touching it or be put behind glass, I will use arsenic myself to this day, no question about it. As taxidermists began to produce more permanent and more anatomically correct mounts, they slowly found a place of respect in the world of natural history. President Thomas Jefferson had explorer Meriwether Lewis tutored in taxidermy before leaving on the groundbreaking Lewis and Clark expedition in 1804. Thomas Jefferson sent him down to Philadelphia to learn preservation techniques, maritime education as well, medical practices for medical emergencies. All of this was placed on young Meriwether Lewis. Lewis's taxidermy survives to this day. A still well-preserved woodpecker currently resides with the Harvard Museum of Natural History. 
but it was a very unscientific endeavor that would give taxidermy its next push forward. Legendary showman P.T. Barnum and his mammoth elephant Jumbo would pave the way for the great museums of the 20th century. The word taxidermy originates from two Greek words, taxis, meaning movement, and derma, meaning skin. Taxidermy will return on Modern Marvels. Again, we turn to taxidermy on Modern Marvels. The Field Museum in Chicago represents the golden age of scientific taxidermy. Visitors to the museum are confronted with fighting elephants posed in combat for well over a hundred years. The figures in the Four Seasons of the Deer, commissioned in 1900, still interact in accurately depicted dioramas. And the man-eating lions of Tsavo still look hungrily out at museum visitors. But there's an even bigger taxidermy operation behind the scenes. It's the specimens in these drawers that will uh, aid scientists in uncovering and unlocking the, the huge number of mysteries that still surround us regarding this planet. And then ultimately, whatever is learned by studying those mysteries will be uh, displayed downstairs. Because one of the main missions of this museum is public education and taking what we learn upstairs and telling the public about it accurately. The Field Museum was the birthplace of modern taxidermy under the direction of innovator Carl Akeley. He was essentially the father of modern taxidermy, and even calling him that doesn't give him the credit that's due. He was the first person to actually mount animals such that they were in their natural habitat. When you saw an Akeley mount, you saw what the animal looked like in real life. And you saw that not only in the color of the skin, you saw it in the shape of a muscle. These are art pieces, just like people go to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa. Many people come here to see Carl Akeley's work because he was an artist. Hakley is credited with perfecting the sculptured hollow mannequin technique of mounting life-sized animals. First, the skeleton of the skinned animal would be reassembled. Next, the musculature would be sculpted in great detail from measurements and notes taken in the field. Then the figure would be molded in plaster. When dried and pulled apart, the interior of the mold would be coated with burlap and glue. The lightweight burlap mount that emerged from the mold would be a nearly perfect duplicate of the animal's original body. These revolutionary ideas were already in the back of the mind of Carl Akeley at the age of 19, when an amazing opportunity befell him. His employer at the time, taxidermist Henry Ward, was called in to salvage the remains of a circus elephant hit by a train on September 15, 1885. Young Carl was sent to St. Thomas, Ontario to see what, if anything, could be done. Jumbo was the star of P.T. Barnum's greatest show on Earth. At a height of 11 and a half feet and a weight of over six tons, he represented a truly formidable taxidermy project. Again, that period of time, no such thing as Federal Express, no tractor trailers. By the time they got to the point where the elephant died, it was half deteriorated. It was almost decomposed. Phineas Barnum had already made his name in taxidermy. His American Museum, a permanent freak show and emporium of oddities, which entertained the general public between 1841 and 1865, demonstrated that the public had a paying interest in taxidermy. His interest was never scientific. He would exhibit real animals opposite such imagined oddities as the Fiji mermaid. This specimen is actually a monkey body sewn to a fishtail. Barnum believed crowds would also flock to the mounted body of Jumbo. The methods used were the best in the day. They made a, a framework of wood, tons and tons of iron nails, wooden lats to take up the space of ribs and bone, wire cloth, plaster of Paris, paper mache, more excelsior, and just constantly doing this until the, fit, the skin finally fit. Barnum's hunch was correct. Displayed beside his own reassembled skeleton, Jumbo did become a bigger draw after death. Carl Akeley was on his way. Akeley's first museum work was for the Milwaukee Public Museum, and he joined Chicago's Field Museum in 1906. Here, and later at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, Akeley not only perfected the look of the animal, he raised the art of the diorama to a new level. These scenes, based on the paintings of artists sent on location, are accurate down to the tiniest plants. He and his wife Delia worked incredible hours 
casting each and every one of the individual leaves. So he took great pains to, to recreate not only the animal as accurately as possible, but the habitat that that animal came from. Hakley's attention to detail would cost him over his lifetime. He insisted on studying his subjects in their natural environments. Carl Hakley was attacked twice in Africa, once by a, a leopard that he thought was a warthog, turned out to be a leopard, and the leopard hurt him pretty badly. The second time was when hunting elephants, he just got too close to a wounded animal and the elephant actually pinned him to the ground. And fortunately for, for Carl Akeley, the one tusk of the animal hit a rock or a root several feet into the dirt that stopped that massive forehead from crushing his chest. But if you saw pictures of him afterwards, you, you would know if he went through a plane crash or war or, or what. But he, he really, really, really came close to losing his life with the elephant. Hakley died in Africa in 1926, possibly a victim of his passion for his craft. Described as a workaholic, it's believed the cause of his death was exhaustion compounded by a lifetime working with a taxidermist's deadly preservative, arsenic. Still, he did pass on his dream of bringing fantastic scenes of the four corners of the world to the American public. Hakley's work inspired many taxidermists, including the 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt. As a young boy with many health problems, Roosevelt found release in taxidermy. These birds, mounted by young Roosevelt in Egypt in 1872, reside at his birthplace in New York. As president, Roosevelt brought his love of taxidermy to the White House. When he was with his cabinet, he would suddenly stop the meeting and listen. He heard a particular wobbler, or he, he heard a particular songbird. And to be able to identify what that was by what he heard stopped the meeting in progress. He always wanted to be where natural history was, where adventure was. And fortunately for him, he had the means to do it all. He took a, a really long, extensive trip to Canada and literally put a, a bearskin rug in front of every office in the White House, as well as mounting one for his own trophy room. Another inspired young man, Louis Paul Jonas, would help make taxidermy available to the hobbyist. Jonas worked with Carl Akeley in New York. Here, he mounts an elephant the Akeley way, first sculpting an underbody in clay over a wood and iron form, next fitting the skin, then creating a plaster cast of the fitted skin, which would be used to create a paper mache undermount, and then refitting the skin for final display. In 1908, Louis Paul Jonas struck out with brothers John, Coleman, and Guy to open their own taxidermy shop in the strategically located city of Denver, Colorado. All the trains came in to Denver. Hunters would come through first, and, you know, they'd have a couple hours to roam around, and Granddad would hand out the price list. And, of course, a deer head was very expensive. That was $10. <laughs> now they're 520 plus. Jack Jonas, a successful animal appraiser, was present as his grandfather and great uncles grew their successful shop into one of the largest taxidermy supply companies in the world. One time, we had 110 employees. That's big for a taxidermy company. And we did, oh, close to four and a half million dollars, but that covered the taxidermy, the tanning department, uh, the supplies which we're selling, all the taxidermists, their mannequins and pliers and hammers and nails and cords and anything they needed. Today, Jonas Brothers continues to provide everything from full taxidermy to parts like teeth and eyes and tools. Well, literally, we sell to taxidermists around the world from all walks of life, uh, from hobbyists to uh, full-time uh, working professionals. Jonas Brothers may have scaled down from a work staff of 110, but it's still a testament to the popularity of taxidermy. Parts and tools are still a big part of the business, but cloth, plaster, and paper molds have given way to dense polyurethane foam. For creating the form of mannequin, initially we start off with a clay sculpture that is either started from either a carcass cast or sculpted right over like the actual uh, skull or skeleton of, of, a, of an animal. From that sculpture, we then make a uh, fiberglass mold, which becomes our, our master for creating forms. Uh, the mold is reassembled, and then we shoot the urethane foam into that mold, and that creates the form. Traditional displays are being challenged in popularity by new dramatic poses, some inspired by nature, 
and some drawn more from the taxidermist's imagination. There are also customers with interests that border on the bizarre. This bear will be posed to greet guests with a silver serving tray. This baboon will also work as a greeter. This is just going to be for a conversation piece. This little guy will be holding an ostrich egg. Sometimes we do serving trays on that. Um, like th this is actually an artificial egg that we make. And uh, so this will be, his arms will be spread open like this. And then he'll, there you go, just like that. Voila. <laughs> Perhaps one of the oddest requests the Jonas Brothers ever received was from 40s and 50s cowboy movie star Roy Rogers. Rogers was an avid hunter who had big game mounts throughout his Victorville, California ranch. Roy decided he wanted his movie horse Trigger and his movie dog Bullet preserved with taxidermy at the times of their deaths. I got to know Roy pretty well because I, I spent about five weeks up into the Arctic Circle. We had 21 days where there was no hunting at all. And uh, so I got to know Roy quite well. He called me one day and asked me whether we would mount Trigger, and Roy was excited as hell. The Jonas Company ended up passing on the job, but Trigger and Bullet were mounted by Bischoff's Taxidermy of California and are currently on display at the Roy Rogers Day 11's Museum in Branson, Missouri. Good taxidermy creates a moment frozen in time. And that's exactly the next leap the art form takes, as freeze drying becomes the next tool in the arsenal of the taxidermist. The hide of Jumbo the Elephant weighed an estimated 1,500 pounds. Taxidermy will return on Modern Marvels. At Extreme Taxidermy on Modern Marvels. In Bedford, Ohio, the coolest taxidermy company is crammed full of exotic animals. Rhino, bear, fox, leopard, and boar crowd the walkways and counties. Even the attic is filled with moose, deer, rhino, and hippo. Most have been preserved using traditional techniques, but some have attained their physical immortality with a relatively new process called sublimation or freeze drying. Here we have a freeze dried snapping turtle, and actually, freeze drying is the best way to do it because there's no skinning involved. Freeze drying is basically just posing it, and you could make it look as mean or as docile as you want by what you do with the posing. But this will last forever. Of course, it is like a rock, and it is definitely the way to do turtles, reptiles, uh, things like that. The idea actually goes back to the ancient Incas, who would store goods at high altitudes where they would freeze and then dehydrate in the low pressure. Human remains from ritual sacrifices have also been discovered at these altitudes. 500 years old and in amazing condition. Freeze drying has been used in more recent times to preserve blood plasma and penicillin during World War II. In the 1960s, freeze drying took the Army K ration into a new era. Based on work done at NASA for astronauts with their sights set on the moon, soldiers could now carry lightweight packets, which became meals when reintroduced to water. Cold water is added to the food bar. There they are, pieces of chicken, carrots, peas. The bar is reversibly compressed. With the addition of water, its ingredients are reconstituted to their original size, shape, texture, and taste. At the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., during the same decade, experiments in freeze drying for taxidermy began. Chokulis flew to Washington to study the new process then set up one of the first commercial freeze-drying operations at his shop. I wanted to do this commercially. I need to have some volume. So I basically put a dish on the building, bought a freezer, 12 by 12 by 30, so I'd have plenty of room for four tanks, found the lead on four pressure cooker tanks from a cannery in New York, and basically built my, my freezer around these machines. This is how the process works. A posed unfrozen animal is placed into a vacuum chamber where the temperature is lowered to the point at which the animal freezes solid. Next, pumps are engaged, removing all air from the chamber. Throughout the animal's cells, frozen water now escapes as a gas, completely skipping the liquid stage. And it goes from an ice crystal to a gas with nothing in between. So if you boil water right here in Ohio, it boils at 212 degrees. You go to Denver, it probably boils at the mid-200s. You go to Mount Everest, it might be a boil at 190. The higher you go in elevation, the lower the boiling point. So if you go to outer space, is what we, what we reproduce in the chamber, is water is boiling away at 40, 50 below zero. 
what remains are cells that are intact in composition and structure. The animal holds its pose now completely devoid of water. Now I'll show you what the freeze dryer is like. A little cold in here. It's full of ice of all kinds. And in here we've got deer that are in a velvet, which is really the only way to freeze dry, uh, to preserve velvet on horns. We have a lot of fish, there's a bass. We drill holes in the back to speed it up so the moisture can, can release and freeze dry sooner. But it's great for these little fish. There's probably about a 25, 30 pound musky. And right now there's a lot of fish in the machine, but as you can see with the size of it, we can get in something pretty large, whether it be a, a small pony like we've done. People really think that, that freeze dry is really quick, but a fish this size, this five pound bass, is probably gonna take about five to six weeks in the machine. Then over here, there's another chamber. What We're also doing processing of meat for the food bank and for hunters, but we do a lot of crickets. These crickets are frozen now. You can see they're like a rock. When they'll come out of the freeze dryer, they'll just be loose like grains of sand. The crickets will be sold as pet food for lizards, just one of the side jobs a freeze dryer can pick up. Joe has also used the vacuum chamber to restore water damaged documents. We can take a soggy book, we have one now that is from 1600s, it was solid wet, they could do absolutely nothing with it. We could take it, put it in the freeze dryer, it might get a little wrinkly, but you could open through every page. Joe has another side business in freeze drying wedding and funeral flowers. They too will last virtually forever. But perhaps his most unusual freeze-drying endeavor comes right back around to taxidermy. Joe freeze-dries family pets. People send us pets basically from all over the country because people are attached to pets because some don't have children, but they've had it a lot of years, and they become attached to it. They rather see that pet and be able to look at it and say, wow, that's, it's in their mind, it's still there. It's better than a photograph, and it's odd that it's probably split 50-50. Some people think that that's horrible, and the other 50% Wow, can I have your card? Here we have a mixed breed dog, probably about 40 pounds in weight that we're waiting for a customer to come pick up that we did in a laying down, actually a sleeping position. We asked for photographs so that we could pose it how they tend to lay. Then here we have a cat, again, same thing as far as the pose is concerned as to how this cat liked to sleep. The fur is very soft. And by combing it, they at least have it so they can feel it. And here we have the first freeze-dried dog, which was done in 1969. And as you can see from it, I mean, the muscle is basically turned into almost stone, and it's a very good way to really show how durable durable freeze dry taxidermy is. While freeze drying uses nearly every part of the specimen being mounted, a new twist on an old method in taxidermy is gaining popularity. It utilizes no part of the hunted animal or fish and often takes death completely out of the taxidermy equation. Pet taxidermy was a popular custom in 19th century England. No proper Victorian home was complete without a glass case filled with stuffed cats, dogs, and birds. Taxidermy will return on Modern Marbles. Return to taxidermy on Modern Marbles. At the base of the Urama Falls in Venezuela, an angler makes a rare catch. This prehistoric looking payara fish will be weighed, photographed, okay. and then let go. Yes. It's the job of experts like Mike Kirkhart in Stewart, Florida, to reproduce these fish using no parts of the actual fish. The body and teeth are fiberglass, the eyes are glass. When color is applied to the fiberglass payara with an airbrush, the result is an uncanny representation. An offshoot of traditional taxidermy is mold reproduction. No skins or actual parts of the alligator were used in this mount. Likewise, this Komodo dragon is entirely fabricated, based on a mold created from the actual animal. Furless animals don't skin and mount well. Fish are even harder. Reproducing, say, sharks, which were difficult to skin mount. This is where fiberglass probably was most used in the early days. They have no bone structure. There's a lot of cartilage in fin areas. There's too much collapse, oil shrinkage. 
difficulty in managing the skin. This rhino head is also cast in fiberglass, a popular alternative trophy for the hunter who can no longer afford the permits to hunt and kill big game. What we do now is we do a reproduction for the fellas that go out and dart the animals. Uh, they actually spend anywhere between six to nine thousand dollars to dart a live animal. They take their picture and then normally as all they would have for their dollar was that photograph. Well now we can take and duplicate the horn into the size that they have off of the picture. And so then we can transfer that size onto this particular piece completely painted up with our airbrushing uh, fellows over in the studio and give them something for their wall besides a picture. Nowhere in taxidermy has the fiberglass mount been more accepted than in the world of sport fishing. Forty years ago, they went out and caught fish, and the day was all about bringing every fish you could home. It became pretty clear that we need to reconsider keeping everything that we caught. And there's been a lot of limitations. Some of them are forced, some of them are volunteered, you know, by conservation-minded sportsmen. Creating a lifelike fish from a photo requires that a similar fish has already been molded, and that mold is in stock. Fortunately for fishermen, Mike has been a prodigious mold maker. As they were limiting what they catch, what size you could keep, I realized I need to start building molds on fish. And so I built about 1,800 molds. These are all the different molds that I've built in the 27 years I've been doing this. So we've got everything from turtles, a largemouth bass that would weigh about 550 pounds, over to a giant sawfish that would be seven, 800 pounds. It's 18 feet long. Uh, giant marlin that are in the thousands of pound range, 1,000 to 1,700 pounds is our largest. Mike continues to add to his mold collection. This is a garfish, which Mike poses in sand before covering with plaster. The whole creative artistic process of fiberglass reproductions in the mold building. So when you get a, a specimen, I use sand to actually support the shaping that I want of the fish to make it look like it's swimming or at rest, but natural. And in using the sand, I create the separation point of the two halves of the mold that, that's to be made. Interesting things like, you know, the, the position of the mouth, the position of the gills, the positions of the fins are all in the ability to be able to hold that positioning of that fish in place. And there's a million tricks and ways that it can be done. When it's dry, the fish and mold will be flipped over and the second side of the mold will be poured. Plaster casts are eventually reproduced in fiberglass, which are durable and allow for endless reproductions of a single fish. This is the great white shark fins. What she's doing right now is actually putting liquid resin in. It's a liquid that goes to a solid. But what she's doing now is showing the reinforcement material, the fiberglass, in with the resin. And once it's cured, then the two halves of this mold will go together, and it'll cure, and then we'll pop that apart, and out will come a casting of the fin of this great white shark. This is the, um, the work area where we do all the dirty work, you know, the finishing assembly, the grinding, transforming these castings from a raw casting into the finished product before it gets painted. Uh, right now, Buddy is preparing to set some teeth into a payara, one of the fish that we caught down in Venezuela. The final step is painting. Airbrushes, big guns, lots of paint, lots of air moving. So it's a kind of interesting process. And a lot of people compliment me with my ability, and I, I tell them that anybody can do this. I suppose it's like playing a musical instrument, put enough time into it, your heart's there. Airbrushing is no different. The finished product provides the fisherman his trophy his memory, while preserving the species for future fishing. Sportsmen are, in increasing numbers, finding this an acceptable trade-off in taxidermy. And they tend to be the ones that want to release the fish and are very comfortable with the idea of, you know, taking a photograph, letting the fish go, and then contacting someone like myself, as opposed to killing fish and dragging it into whoever locally would accept the job. Fiberglass reproduction is one practice changing the look and methodology of taxidermy. Another is plastination, a breakthrough in body preservation that has people lining up in museums. The specimens on exhibit are breaking new ground as well. They're human beings. A fiberglass reproduction of a 1,700-pound marlin weighs only 75 pounds. Taxidermy will return on Modern Marlins.
Our return to Taxidermy on Modern Marvels. The exhibit is called Body Worlds, and it has been breaking attendance records in Asia, Europe, and now the United States. The posed bodies are human, a fascination that some taxidermists have had for centuries. The 19th century French taxidermist Louis de Fran wrote about how to do it, which suggests that at one time or another, he experimented with taxidermy on humans. He describes how the human body is not at all conducive to taxidermic technology. The opaqueness of our skin, the lack of ability to recreate the anatomy, we're always confronted with the human form. So to see the human form in that grotesque condition in that grotesque of a shape, it could make anybody steer away from even wanting to go near a taxidermy as, and using that process in preserving the human body. East German-born anatomist Dr. Gunther von Huggins has not only discovered how to preserve and present human beings, he's proven that the public has a great interest in their display. To all the intestines, but he's sort of... I'm a kind of showman. Uh, every good teacher is a kind of showman. Uh, I have to present something in a very interesting, very lifelike, way. Uh, what I actually do is I try to open the hearts of the people to themselves, to their own body. Like their animal counterparts in the great museums of this country, these displayed humans are on a mission to educate. You have to recognize yourself as a specimen, not this is a specimen. Oh, this could uh, be myself. Actually, this is responsible for the big success of body worlds. Seeing firsthand the effects of smoking on the lung has made a real impact on some that visit the exhibit. At independent uh, service show, people smoke to 10% less or not anymore, 50% think more of uh, their health, and 30% are more likely to donate their organs for organ donation programs. Dr. Von Hagens uses a new process called plastination to preserve not only skin and hair, but also muscles and organs, even the circulatory and nervous systems. 70% of our body consists of water. Water gives life, also decay is life. No water, no life, no decay. In plastination, water is removed, and specimens are impregnated with a reactive polymer, like silicon rubber, epoxy, or polyester resin. Plastinate specimens are dry, odorless, and durable. They retain their cellular identity down to the microscopic level. Like here's a tongue, here would be my lung, a smoker's lung, that's not my lung, and <laughs> Here, the heart, the liver, the stomach, all here, the intestine. So it shows where the specimens are situated. Like the traditional taxidermist, Von Hagen's attempts to recreate life through the posing of the specimen. A dancer stands on point. A soccer player is frozen mid-kick. And a skateboarder handstands inside a half pipe. The macabre sense of humor sometimes present in taxidermy is at work here, too. This harrowing looking figure has been dubbed Wingman. His anatomy has been played outward to give visitors yet another way of viewing the human body. The creator added a man's straw hat to the figure in an effort to make him less frightening to children. Both the rider and the horse were once very much alive. The Shine Horse's Rider is the example for comparative anatomy at its best. To show the human brain compared to the small horse brain. And the opposite, to show the big muscle of the horse and the feeble muscles of the human body. The exhibit is designed to showcase the different functional systems of the human body. It begins with the muscles and movement, then presents the brain and its elaborate network of nerves. The circulatory system can be viewed intact but completely separate from its former human host. To represent the reproduction system, Dr. Von Hagen's displays two truly shocking figures. The woman and her fetus both died during the eighth month of pregnancy. There could be no better specimens to illustrate that than a pregnant woman. And when I got the specimen, by full consent, I knew this has to uh, go into the exhibition. The pregnant woman and child may move onlookers, but perhaps the most moving plastinate in this exhibit for Dr. Von Hagen's is less noticed. This is a man he describes as his best friend. To plastinate my best friend, it was at first to fulfill his last wish, his testimony. He wanted to become a plastinate 
because he felt to be too young to end on a cemetery. He had a malignant kidney tumor, so he knew he had to live maximum of one year. When dissecting him, I needed about uh, three times as much time, but it was good for my morning work. It was like he stretched his hand across the barrier of death to me, and uh, so I got in peace with him. Each year in Alaska, the Department of Fish and Game grants an average of 700 permits to hunt Kodiak bears in an effort to control the population. He's big. He's over nine foot. The fee is $500, but Joe Coolis of Bedford, Ohio, has spent an additional 5000 in expenses to take his shot. Take him now, Joe. He's down. He's hit hard. He's on his back in a hole. Coolis isn't here to bring food back for the family table. He's only after the skin and pelt. With at least two additional bears circling the kill, Coolis must quickly skin and flesh the Kodiak's hide. The massive bundle of fur now begins a remarkable journey that will take it first to the tanner, where the skin is salted, pickled, and turned into a soft, nearly permanent leather. Then it's shipped to Coolis's own taxidermy shop and studio. Here, it's fitted over a foam form and glass eyes. The finished mount is an uncanny match for the bear coolest bag in the frozen north. And now you have a life-size photograph, so to speak. You can look at it and say, oh, I remember when that happened and this happened. And then a lot of times it's definitely dangerous. So I think it's the accomplishment of what you have to go through and then achieving something, then reproducing it so it looks exactly like it did when it lied. You put all those things together and now you have something you think, wow, that was really great. Very few people are neutral when confronted with a once living head hanging from a wall or a giant predator frozen at the moment of attack. Many find the ancient practice of mounting animals for display disturbing and downright macabre. Enthusiasts of taxidermy, however, feel a thrill and are in awe of what could be described as still lives of nature perfectly preserved. When you get into taxidermy, it encompasses so many other kinds of work. Anatomy, biology, chemistry, woodworking, natural design. So when you put it all together under the word taxidermy, you, you can't help but not encompass the word art with it. The practice of taxidermy is undeniably popular. Experts estimate the number of practicing taxidermists to be as high as 35,000 in the United States alone. I tell them what I do and they take a step back away from me and some people scream and run away and mostly women are very upset by the fact but I see it, it as a very creative profession and I have a great deal of respect and love for the animals that I work on. We aren't barbarians, you know, our industry, our artistry is not antiquated. There was a, you know, recent kids film that 102 Dalmatians where you know, the, the, there was a taxidermist that was used. He was the evil villain. And that's certainly not what we are at all. We like to think of ourselves as professionals and, and artists, and we're doing a public service. The origins of taxidermy are tied to some of our first basic needs, clothing and shelter. I have to go back to Genesis. When Adam and Eve were, were banned from the Garden of Eden, the Lord God himself took the very first animal skin and fashioned clothing for Adam and Eve to wear. The need for animal skins for clothing and shelter soon led directly to the first crude forms of taxidermy. Primitive man did taxidermy by learning that he needed to come up with a decoy. An animal hide draped over a rock, bush, or even the hunter himself allowed us to get in close with spears and knives. Remember, there wasn't the loud noise of gunshot. Everything was all close encounters. So they had to be very, very close to make these little flint tools do their work. For taxidermy to evolve beyond the ability to fool animals, a permanency would need to be added to the furs and hides. This process of chemically transforming skin into leather would come to be known as tanning. I think one of the most amazing testaments that we have in our time is the Iceman found in the Swiss Alps, 5,000 year old corpse who had leather shoes, leather bow quiver. Preserved hides now gave us a better chance against sometimes overwhelming elements. Well, we can go back as far as the Egyptians. They had a process of tanning animal skin into leather. 
Not only were the Egyptians adept at tanning, they developed some of the first practices of body preservation. And their work was not confined to humans. Mummified cats, dogs, apes, and oxen have been found in royal tombs alongside preserved kings and slaves. Pets were primarily mummified to serve members of the royal clan in the afterlife. Body preservation was discovered quite by accident when it was noticed that animals and humans who died in arid conditions didn't quickly decompose. Ridding a body or hide of fluids was the first step toward preserving a skin through time. Later, across the Mediterranean, Greeks and Romans were using preservation techniques to make different styles of sandals, boots, and shoes. They used barks, fruit peels, and leaves as tannin sources. These agents render the leather immune to decay and shrinkage. A tour around a modern tannery reveals that the techniques for processing skin into leather have been refined, but have remained essentially unchanged. A Greek, Roman, or Egyptian tanner would quickly become very comfortable with the equipment and tanning agents found here. Before these hides can be mounted by a taxidermist, they must be processed into leather. This is the stock room where we store all the skins that are delivered to the tannery. Most of this stuff here is deer and elk. Right here is a Cape Buffalo half mount. This is the head part, the feet, and the back of the hide. And over here, we have a, a giraffe leg. It came in pieces. We have four legs. We had the, the cape, and we had uh, the hide over here. Before hides are tanned, excess layers of skin are cut away in a process called thinning. On large games such as elephant, rhino, or hippo, skin can be several inches thick. It must be brought down to less than a quarter inch so that the tanning solutions can be evenly absorbed. This hippo hide is being cut down with an ancient looking skiving knife. For large animals, this process can take weeks. The shavers have to break the resistance of the skin but they can't make it too thin or too thick. If too thick, they won't get no stretch out of it. Too thin, the hair will fall out. After being shaved, skins are tossed into large vats filled with alum and salt. Alum draws out the living enzymes in the skin, turning it into leather. The skin's going that wet drum with the pickling agent. Once they come out of there, they're actually leather. From tanning to taxidermy, preserved furs could now be pulled over forms of wood and straw to create semi-permanent figures for display. These early underframes were often made by upholsterers and furniture builders. In these very early frames, the actual skulls of the animals being mounted were used. The skull of the animal was boiled and clean and scraped full of flesh and tissue. A wooden armature was set. The baseboard was shaped to accommodate the skull, add some support to the building materials, which would be excelsior, cotton, straw, wrapped with twine to fill the voids, that was known as the old English style of taxidermy. Early bird undermounts were even simpler. Here's just a couple examples of, of a typical structure that's inside of bird mounts. In most older museums, we have these traditional mannequins that are put together. With